and her uh, Advent ser uh, service, which can be accessed through Zoom or, or, or live. She's not here today because they, they experienced a little bit of damage at their house with their HVAC unit and their garage door was caved in, so please keep them and other people at Willoughby Station in your prayers along with all those who have been severely impacted by those, uh, by those storms. This is the last day to order youth poinsettias. There's uh, order forms in the bulletin. You can designate someone to honor or, or uh, to, memor to hold in memory through those donations. Let us uh, prepare our hearts now to worship God as we prepare our way to Bethlehem to see the baby. All right, if you'll join me in the call to worship, please stand. Let us make a place for God in the wilderness of our hearts. Let us make a way for God in the desert of our emotions. Let us make room for God in the crowdedness of the season. Let us worship God now with praise and singing. We are glad you're here as we're awaiting the arrival of Jesus, hence the come thou long expected Jesus will be our opening song. Please join us in this. Lord of light, you gave yourself 
to this world by the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. We thankfully rejoice and praise you for your peace and light shared with all nations. Now center us King of glory during these prayerful giving. We present these gifts as your humble and willing servants in the name of the one who comes to us anew, Jesus, the living Christ, amen. Good morning. Our Advent wreath reminds us of the approaching celebration of Jesus' birth. The evergreen leaves remind us that God's love is everlasting. The round wreath symbolizes God's eternal love. The light of the candle stands for the light which Jesus brought into a dark world. Today, we relight the first two candles of the Advent wreath. The candle of hope and the candle of peace. Now we light the third candle of Advent. This is the candle of joy. As the coming of Jesus, our Savior, draws nearer, our joy builds with our anticipation of his birth. From the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 18, we read the words of our Lord. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, the Apostle Paul says this, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control if we live by the spirit let us also be guided by the spirit let us pray we joyfully praise you O lord for the fulfillment of your promise of a savior and what that means in our lives thank you for the gift of salvation through the birth of your son jesus create us anew as we wait and help us to see your glory as you fill our lives with your living spirit Amen. Thank you, guys. Do I have sound? Keep talking? Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> you know, um... <laughs> Just this week, I was with a group of people from other churches, and uh, we began our time together with the greeting, the Lord, no, wait, wait, God is good, and all the time, and someone said, that's a Baptist greeting, and I said, praise the Lord, we're ecumenical at Bethlehem, you know, God is good all the time, even in Baptist churches, and and you know, I have seen the goodness of God in so many ways this past week that it makes me want to do a backflip. If I could do a backflip, I would do a backflip right now. And just one of those ways is in Robin Folks leading the staff, some who are skilled in baking like Pat Smith and some who are definitely not like me, and, and baking a thousand cookies for teachers in our, our community. So God was definitely at work in that, um, in that project. And I know God's been at work in your lives or things you'd like to celebrate. So wh where have you seen God at work or what celebrations would you like to lift up? Mike has a microphone for you so that we can all hear you. in our uh, project to build a wheelchair ramp and a new porch for uh, a man that's on our Meals on Wheels route. And we appreciate and, and celebrate the, uh, the people who have, have 
supported it monetarily and the people who are working to support it through the building process. Great. God has been at work in Sharon and I uh, being married for 29 years today. Congratulations. Sharon, has ar I would argue that God has been a, a lot of work <laughs> for that day. Amen. Teresa. I'd like to ask for prayers for Vicki Prem. She was the lady that was um, trying to get out of her house and uh, the house fell on her. She was mm -hmm. on the news. She's at Vanderbilt. She's had a couple surgeries. Um, she's in critical condition, but she's a dear friend mm. of mine and Trace. Yeah. Keep all of those impacted through the storms in your prayer, and especially Teresa and Trey's friend. It was really a, um, a God sighting to see all the angel tree gifts coming in. Last week, we had about half of them still on the tree. They've all been selected. The, the gifts are here, so... What a neat way to see God at work. Uh, Mike, Steve. Uh, I just want to lift up my, uh, my stepmother's mother, uh, Helen. She died a couple days ago of a heart attack, and it was pretty unexpected. So uh, her whole family is grieving. And so I'll be praying for peace in my, uh, my dad's house um, this week. So thank you. It's a hard, hard loss, and you guys have had a few this year. I, I was in a meeting with, um, with uh, leaders from, from the Restore Ministry, uh, Journey uh, Freedom Group, and um, Scott Reel, who's written the books for, for the Journey to Freedom programs, talked about a Zoom meeting he had with people from Ukraine. And, you know, it's, 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 it's easy to read through the news and say, oh, that must be terrible, you know, but then to hear someone who's, re who's talked with people who are there frightened for their lives, it just kind of, kind of recreates an, uh, uh, an immediacy that you don't normally have. And so we, we, we do want to pray for people threatened with war and, and violence around the world in this season of, of peace. I also wanted to lift up our college students who are sitting in the back row, Russell and Quentin. Hello. <laughs> and Allison. There's Allison. Hi, Allison. And uh, Ian and Maggie were at Broom Ball last night. We had a blast uh, hitting the ball around on ice and falling on our backsides. And so um, it is always and everywhere a good thing to see our college students return home. So love you guys. Here, uh, Gabby. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who participated in um, the mission market and those that shopped. It was a great, um, uh, what's the word I want to say, that we got to do it again because we, we missed out on it in 2020. So we're just really grateful to everyone that was able to come and we look forward to doing it again next year. I don't have a total yet of all the uh, money that was raised, but I know that all the agencies that were um, represented were very grateful. So thank mm -hmm. you all. Thank you, and what a neat way to reach out to the community and get some holiday shopping done and have fun at church. Also, uh, uh, Steve's greeting the college students reminded me that Russell Pogue had surgery this week. I had a prayer with him and his mom on the way to the hospital. I had some injury to his shoulder, so keep them in your prayers. Anybody else? Spend a moment in quiet reflection as we prepare our hearts for prayer.
Come thou long expected Jesus, as we open the gift of expectation in the new way that you want to be at work in our lives, remove our barriers of pride, cynicism, and apathy that would prevent us from receiving all that you have for us. Thank you for John's message in the desert, calling us to repent and believe the good news. Come now, long expected Jesus. Bless our Stevens ministry, bless our restore programs and all our healing relationships with one another, that those who are hurting might find comfort in you. Come now, long expected Jesus. Bless our Room in the Inn program, that the homeless might have a place to stay warm. And most of all, that they would know the warmth of your love. Thank you for those who have found places of their own and help us to join with others to put an end to homelessness. Come now long expected Jesus, bless our angel tree ministry, bless the children and families who receive the gifts and help us to grow in the spirit of generosity and gratitude for all the ways that you bless us. Come now, long expected Jesus, bless our prayer times, bless our Advent studies and Sunday school classes, that we might be truly transformed in your image. Come now, long expected Jesus, bless our children, our youth, our college students as they return home, those who have joined us this morning. Bless those as they finish their tests and other requirements for the semester. May they know that we care for them and that you love them. Come thou long expected Jesus. Bless our homebound members. Bless those who grieve, those who are sick, those who are injured, those who struggle with mental illness, with addiction, and those who struggle to receive you as the one who gives us peace and hope and joy. Bless the leaders of our world, bless the leaders of our nation, our community leaders, our church leaders. We lift up the concerns that have been named along with praises and celebrations that have been shared as we pray now as you taught us say, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. The children are invited to the front today for a children's moment. Come join me. Come on, Brady. Okay, how many of you are getting ready for Christmas? Yes, what are you doing to get ready? What are you doing to prepare? Um, I turn on a lot of lights outside my yard. That's good. What are you doing? I'm, I'm, um, I'm putting lights. I'm still decorating my Christmas tree, and I just finished it. Okay. I'm very excited, Lou, because I'm going to make a birthday cake for Jesus, and I brought my pan to show you. Get ready. Look. How about that? Oh, do you think that's going to make a yummy cake? Uh, Blue, look. I, well, I made some mistakes in my pan. So I went to crack an egg, and I left some shell. So there's eggshell. And then I was having some pizza, and some of the sauce got in there. And that's some old jalapeno stem. Do you think that'd make a good cake? That'd make a gross cake, wouldn't it? 
What do you think would happen, Lou, if I put that in a cake? Could I just decorate over top? Would you eat that? If I just, could I just decorate it and make it? What do I have to do with this pan first? Yeah, clean it. Clean it. I need to clean it out. So what shape is my pan? A heart. A heart. I brought a heart pan to remind us that the most important thing that we can prepare for Christmas is our heart. There's no amount of decorating that can cover up a heart that's not ready for Jesus. And Lou, let, we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll show you on our way out. One Christmas Eve, I was getting ready. For, the service was starting. Everybody was starting to light their candles. And we were getting ready to sing Silent Night. And I wanted to say, stop. Everybody stop. Because I realized my house had lights, my tree was up, I'd made a bunch of cookies, but I hadn't taken time to get ready in my heart for Jesus. And John the Baptist says the way that we do that is to spend time with Jesus, to think about others more than we think about ourselves, to be honest and to do the right thing. But that's not always easy to do, is it? Sometimes we make mistakes, right? But the good news is God never makes mistakes. So if we say, God, we want you to help us live the right way, he will. And if we say, God, we want you, please forgive us and clean our hearts, he does that. And then we will be prepared for Christmas. Will you pray with me? Will you repeat after me as I pray? Dear God, Thank you for Jesus. Please clean our hearts and help us live in a way that celebrates your love. Amen. Maybe a new one for us. Um, I'm sure you've all decorated for Christmas. Has everybody got the decorations up? We got the decorations up. We have, there are two different types of families. There's the, the family that has like a couple of trees. Like anybody in here, the two tree family? Yes, you got the two trees. You don't have to, you know, I, I guess, you know, we'll keep it under wraps. But yeah, that's the, where there's one beautiful tree, the adult tree that like, is everything's perfect and then there's the tree like our tree at our house that it looks like Christmas just kind of puked all over it and it's just like everything's just kind of haphazard on there but I love that and we've got the, the house decorated and especially on our uh, TV cabinet there's uh, nativity sets and you probably have a nativity set in your house and I like walking by our nativity set because there's Jesus little baby Jesus attended to by Joseph and Mary and uh, the three wise men angel two slightly disproportionately large Santa Clauses there at the birth of baby Jesus. We got a, a Clifford the Big Red Dog is at the birth of baby Jesus at our nativity set. And I started thinking about that and this song's called Behold Him, right? And I think everyone deserves to be there at the birth of Christ, right? We're all witness to this. Praise the Lord. And even this season, as things get hectic and we might be at our wits end with trying to get everything done and worried like cause us to do things like maybe get a little impatient like I was uh, getting gas at Costco and people cutting in line just I gotta get my gifts and get back home but for all of that there's dozens of stories that we have to pay attention to like uh, read about a single mom who needed a washer and dryer so she goes and this guy was selling it for five hundred dollars and she says would you take $400 because I'm a single mom just had this baby and just don't have a lot of money. He said, all right, I'll take $400. On the way home, he sends her a text and says, oh, man, I forgot to clean the lint screen on the dryer. So when you get home, you may just want to open it up and clean up the lint screen. She gets home and opens up the lint screen, and in there is $400 and a note that says, this is for the baby. Get him something nice all for the baby you know this season when we behold him there's an opportunity to look out for the good and and to be the good we try to continue that after the birth he who was 
was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him. Paid with blood to settle our debts Buried death as he rose to life Behold him, Jesus Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the roaring lion Oh, be still and behold Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior, oh, be still and behold Him, oh, oh, oh. holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Sing with us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Sing out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Scripture lesson today comes from uh, Luke 3, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. 
Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire, his winnowing fork in his hand, to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Scott. Christy. And now, Lord, sow the seed of thy word into our hearts and nurture it by thy grace that it might bring forth abundant fruit for the living of these days. For a tree is known by its fruit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Once in a chapel service at Trevecca University, when it was known as lowly Trevecca College, and I was a student there, Dr. Homer Adams, who was the president at the time, was addressing the students and faculty gathered there for worship. It was about this time of the year. It was early December, mid-December, something like that. But unlike the last couple of days recently, which were exceptionally warm for this time of the year. Back in, in that time, it was unbelievably cold for that time of the year. Ice and snow everywhere. It was, it was cold. I, I, I'm glad you asked. It was so cold. It was so cold that the cops told robbers to freeze, and they did. It was cold. It was really, really cold. And uh, I don't remember a lot of what happened in that service. I don't remember anything really that Dr. Adams said, except for one thing. I do remember that he said, and I doubt if I ever forget it, he said, don't walk in the ice and snow with both hands in your pockets. Don't walk in the ice and snow with both hands in your pockets. I doubt I ever forget that. And so, yeah, I did learn something in college, you know? But you know, believe it or not, there were people who were deeply offended by his warning. They thought he was being a little too patrimonial, you know, and, and I get it, you know, such a sacred service of worship among such esteemed scholars to raise such a mundane, you know, topic as not walking in the ice and snow with, with your hands in your pockets. I get that. But personally, I was not offended. And part of the reason I wasn't offended is because I had been walking around in the, in the ice and the snow with both hands in my pockets because it was so brutally cold. I mean, I might have even inspired his remarks that day. I'm not sure, but it's possible. But he made such a strong case as to why you should never do that that I haven't done it since. So thank you, Dr. Adams. You know, sometimes a warning can be a good thing, right? Sometimes a warning can be good news. In our text today, John the Baptist was full of warnings. You might have noticed. If it was a text, it would have been in all caps. John is filled with warnings in our text today. 
And, um, and yet, a warning can be a good thing. And he wants the people to know, yes, you are chosen. Yes, you are the children of Abraham. Yes, you are the people of God. But don't forget, God can raise children to Abraham from the rocks on this desert floor. And don't forget, a tree is known by its fruits. A tree is known by what it produces. So his biggest warning and concern is that the people of God not take their relationship with God for granted, for granted. Because the whole history of Israel, the whole history uh, of, of the people of God is replete with examples of what happens when the people of God would forget God, when they would forget to take God seriously, when they would take God for granted. Bad things happened. And just to, to cite just two examples, as, as you know, after the death of King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two parts, right? With the kingdom of Israel, still called Israel, in the north, and then the southern kingdom, Judah, in the south, with the, with the city of, of Jerusalem as its capital. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. About 740, King Sennacherib of Assyria began attacking the northern kingdom, dragging the people away in chains. And then by 722, the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom at Samaria, destroyed the city, and, and led all the people away to chain, in chains back to Assyria and other parts of the world, which led to the northern kingdom the people of the northern kingdom becoming known as the ten lost tribes of Israel because they were never established as a nation again. The northern kingdom, gone forever. Gone. And then, around the 6th century, King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon began attacking Judah, right? They attacked Jerusalem, sacked the city, and led all the people to Babylon as exiles and in captivity. Nothing new with any of that sort of thing happening in the ancient world, unfortunately. It happened all the time. One kingdom would conquer another kingdom, attack another kingdom, and they, would, and they would exile the population to other parts of the world. But the Bible explains, the Bible explains what happened to Israel and, and Judah in 2 Kings. This, this is uh, just a description of the Bible's own explanation of what happened. This is from chapter 17 verses 13 through 14a, just the first half of verse 14. The Lord warned Israel and Judah. There's that word again, right? Warned can be a good thing. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all the prophets and seers, telling them, turn from your evil ways. Keep my commandments and my regulations in agreement with the entire instruction that I commanded your ancestors and sent through my servants the prophets, but they wouldn't listen. So that's how the Bible describes what happened to Israel and Judah. They neglected God. They took their relationship with God for granted, and both of their capitals ended up being destroyed. The people were led away in chains. And so when John the Baptist preached out in the desert. He had a pretty good historical precedent as to why it's important to repent and prepare the way of the Lord. And yeah, John could be a little coarse, right? John could be a little abrasive. John did not sugarcoat his message at all. No one would ever confuse John with Joel Olstein. John didn't wear $200 blue jeans. He didn't wear designer suits. 
And you know what else I bet? I bet nobody ever came to John's house for lunch after the service. What are you having, John? Locusts? Oh, well, let, can we take a rain check on that? John was pretty abrasive. He was pretty coarse. But people knew some things about John. They knew he loved God. They knew he told the truth. And they knew that what he said actually mattered. That what he said was important. And so he gave the, the, the people this warning. And the crowd said, well, then what do we do? How do we prepare the way of the Lord? What does it mean to repent? And he said, share with one another. Share. If you've got two coats... Give one to someone who doesn't have one. If you've got more food than you need, share with someone who is hungry. Repentance involves generosity. Preparing the way of the Lord involves sharing. So the tax collectors speak up. They want to make sure that they know that they've heard exactly what John the Baptist is saying. You know, they're pretty precise type people generally. So what about us? What do we do? Well, we know about tax collectors, right? Tax collectors paid a fee to the Roman overlords to have the privilege of receiving all the taxes, all the customs, all the tariffs, all the tolls, and they would charge more than Rome prescribed, and they got filthy rich doing so because they charged a lot more than Rome prescribed. And John said, don't do that anymore. Repentance involves not, not demanding any more than Rome prescribes. Repentance involves preparing the way of the Lord involves being dependable and being honest. Being honest, being dependable. Repentance involves those things. So, then there's the soldiers. And then is now soldiers, at least your, your typical foot soldier, didn't make a huge salary, right? It was just kind of expected that Soldiers would extort a little. They would coerce people and sort of pad their income. So the soldiers said, well, what about us, John? What, what, what are we supposed to do in order to repent, in order to prepare the way of the Lord? And he said, be satisfied with your wages. In other words, repentance involves being content. Preparing the way of the Lord involves being content. Nobody, nobody escaped John's call to repent, right? And nobody escaped hearing John's invitation to a better life to a more abundant life. Because repentance is all about putting on the Christmas spirit. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. Yeah, repentance, preparing the way of the Lord is all about putting on the beautiful Christmas spirit. It means putting dissatisfaction and discontent and selfishness and greed behind us and putting on contentment and, and the Christmas spirit. You know, as Fred Craddock has said, Christmas is really all about going out into the desert on our way to Bethlehem to see the baby Jesus where we meet John and repent. You can't, you can't get to Bethlehem and you can't see the baby 
without going out in the desert and meeting no scary John and repenting. Well, you can't get to Bethlehem without going out in the desert and meeting John and repenting. You can't get to Bethlehem. You just can't get to the baby. You can't get to Jesus. So, repent and believe the good news. Repent and prepare the way of the Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You might have noticed that we've made some changes in the order of service, not, not many particularly for this service, but one change is that we've added a call to worship in both services. I love the call to worship because a call to worship reminds us that we are called here by God's initiative, right? And repentance is a call to worship. Advent is a call to repent and worship the baby. So as we sing our, our, our final song, I just want to ask you to reflect on anything that you might need to leave behind as you make your way to Bethlehem and to see the baby. We stand and sing. Thank you, Craig. As, as you were closing there, I, a quote I saw this week came to mind is, is our greatest fear should not be failing to succeed, but rather succeeding at something that just doesn't matter. First words of this hymn are, Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Let's sing it together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are Where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you cause Jesus you're my hope and say Lord I need you oh You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, oh you're my one defense, 
my righteousness oh god how i need you go now to be people of hope to be people of peace to be people of joy as you prepare the way of the lord and may the love of god the father the grace of the lord jesus christ and communion and fellowship of the holy spirit be with you as you go this day, every day, and forever. Amen. Let's sing it one more time. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Amen.